Hi friends, welcome to Reading Through Romans with me, Jennifer Colburn. Just a reminder that we are reading, picking up in chapter 5 of Romans today, and we will not be studying it, we will not be discussing it, we are just reading God's Word and letting it sit with us today. So join me as we pick up with chapter 6, verse 1. Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We were no longer slaves to sin, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give into sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. Sin is no longer your master, for you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. Well then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean we can go on sinning? Of course not. Don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be sl a slave to sin, which leads to death or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Thank God, once you were slaves of sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching we have, we have given you. Now you are free from your slavery to sin, and you have become slaves to righteous living. Because of the weakness of your human nature, I am using the illustration of slavery to help you understand all of this. Previously, you let yourselves be slaves to impurity and lawness, lawlessness, which led ever deeper into sin. Now you must give yourselves to be slaves to righteous living, so that you will become holy. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do right. And what was the result? You are now ashamed of the things you used to do things that end in, do in eternal doom. But now you are free from the power of sin and have become slaves of God. Now you do those things that lead to holiness and result in eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Chapter 7 Now, dear brothers and sisters, you who are familiar with the law, don't you know that the law applies only while a person is living? For example, when a woman marries, the law binds her to her husband as long as he is alive. But if he dies, the laws of marriage no longer apply to her. So while her husband is alive, she would be committing adultery if she married another man. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law and does not commit adultery when she remarries. So my Dear brothers and sisters, this is the point. You died to the power of the law when you died with Christ. And now you are united with the one who was raised from the dead. As a result, we can produce a harvest of good deeds for God. 
When we were controlled by our old nature, sinful desires were at work within us, and the law aroused these evil desires that produced a harvest of sinful deeds resulting in death. But now we have been released from the law, for we died to it and are no longer captive to its power. Now we can serve God not in an old way of obeying the, the letter of the law, but in the new way of living in the Spirit. Well then, am I suggesting that the law of God is sinful? Of course not. In fact, it was the law that showed me my sin. I would never have known that coveting is wrong if the law had not said, you must not covet. But sin used, used this command to arouse all kinds of covetous desires within me. If there were no law, sin would not have that power. At one time, I lived without un understanding the law. But when I learned the command to not covet, for instance, the power of sin came to life and I died. So I discovered that the law's commands, which were supposed to bring life, brought spiritual death instead. Sin took advantage of those commands and deceived me. It used the commands to kill me. But still, the law itself is holy and it commands the whole, its commands are holy and right and good. But how can that be? Did the law, which is good, cause my death? Of course not. Sin used what was good to bring about my condemnation to death. So we can see how terrible sin really is. It uses God's good commands for its own evil purposes. So the trouble is not with the law, for it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I, do, I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. But if I know that what I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. So I am not the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. And I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature. I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good but I don't. I want to do, I, I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing wrong. It is sin living in me that does it. I have discovered this principle of life, that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's law with all my heart. But there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death. Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So you see how it is in my mind. I really want to obey God's law, but because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. Chapter 8. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in, his, in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the spirit. Those who are dominated by sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind's mind leads you to leads to death, but letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never di did obey God's laws, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember, 
that those who do not have the spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by it, uh, for if you live by its dictates, uh, you will die. But if through the power of the spirit, you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. For all who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Yet, what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory we, he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for that future by when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation will subject to God's curse. But the eager hope the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as, he, as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something we don't need, to hope for it. We don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own, own will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are calling according to his purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son, so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him, and having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for, all, for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who, dare, who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Chapter 9. 
with Christ as my witness, I speak with utter truthfulness. My conscience and the Holy Spirit confirm it. My heart is filled with bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters. For my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters, I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, if that would save them. They are the people of Israel chosen to be God's adopted children. God revealed his glory to them. He made covenants with them and gave them his law. He gave them the privilege of worshiping him and receiving his wonderful promises. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are their ancestors, and Christ himself was an Israelite as far as his human nature is concerned. And he is God, the one who rules over everything and is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. Well then, has God failed to fulfill his promises to Israel? No. For not all who are born into the nation of Israel are true, truly members of God's people. Being descendants of Abraham doesn't make them truly Abraham's children. For the scriptures say, Isaac is the son through whom your descendants will be counted. Through Abraham, though Abraham had other children too, this means that Abraham's physical descendants are not necessarily children of God. Only the children of the promised are considered to be Abraham's children. For God had promised, I will return about this time next year and Sarah will have a son. This son was our ancestor, Isaac. When he married Rebecca, he gave birth to twins. But before they were born, before they had done anything good or bad, she received a message from God. This message shows that God chooses people according to his own purposes. He calls people, but not according to their good or bad works. She was told, your older son will serve your younger son. In the words of scripture, I loved Jacob but I rejected Esau. Are we saying then that God was unfair? Of course not. For God said to Moses, I will show mercy to anyone I chose, and I will show compassion to anyone I chose. So it is God who decides to show mercy. We can neither choose it nor work for it. For the scriptures say that God told Pharaoh, I have appointed you for the very purpose of displaying my power in you and to spread my fame throughout the earth. So you see, God chooses to show mercy to some, and he chooses to harden the hearts of others so they refuse to listen. Well then, you might say, why does God blame people for not responding? Haven't they simply done what he makes them do? No, don't say that. Who are you, a mere human being, to argue with God? Should the thing that was created say to the, to the one who created it, Why have you made me like this? When a potter makes jars out of clay, doesn't he have a right to use the same lump of clay to make one jar for decoration and another to throw, to throw garbage into? In the same way, even though God has the right to show his anger and his power, he is very patient with those on whom his anger falls, who are destined for destruction. He does this to make the rich of his glory shine even brighter on those to whom he shows mercy, who are prepared in advance for glory. And we are among those whom he selected, both from the Jews and from the Gentiles. Concerning the Gentiles, God says, in the prophecy of Hosea, those who were not my people, I will now call my people and I lo will love those whom I did not love before. And then at the place where they were told you are not my people, there they will be called children of the living God. In concerning Israel, Isaiah the prophet cried out, though the people of Israel are are as numerous as the sand of the seashore, only a remnant will be saved. For the Lord will carry out his sentence upon the earth quickly and with finality. And Isaiah said the same thing in, in another place. If the Lord of heaven's armies had not spared a few of our children, he would have wiped out. He would, we would have been wiped out like Sodom, destroyed like Gomorrah. What does this all mean? Even though the Gentiles were not trying to follow God's standards, they were made right with God. 
And it was by faith that this took place. But the people of Israel who tried so hard to get right with God by keeping the law never succeeded. Why not? Because they were trying to get right with God by keeping the law instead of by trusting in him. They stumbled over the great rock in their path. God warned them of this in the scriptures when he said, I am placing a stone in Jerusalem that makes people stumble, a rock that makes them fall. But anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Blessings.